This is part one of a two-part series of videos where I just briefly talk about how biology and culture interact to produce diversity. And obviously they're not the only two factors, but they're two quite important factors to diversity. So when we talk about diversity, we need to talk about these two. And uh, this video I want to talk about uh, briefly an understanding of behavioral genetics and how the field of behavioral genetics, which is the study of um, different uh, traits that we have that influence our behavior and how they're um, how they have genetic components to them. Uh, and I want to talk about how behavioral genetics influences uh, human diversity. So first of all, I should probably explain why we're talking about uh, biology when we talk about diversity, because generally when we talk about diversity, we talk about environmental and uh, cultural differences. But certainly it's obvious that when we look around, uh, biology is responsible for a fair amount of diversity that we see, both in, you know between species and within our own human species. So things like uh, height, we're pretty well sure that things like height have a, a strong biological component. So if I am born to parents who are over six foot, my, my chances of growing into a person that is over six foot uh, is, is a lot stronger than if I was born to a family where the average height was 5'3 or 5'4. So obviously there are environmental factors involved there, but uh, there's a strong genetic component to them. Another factor that, that should be fairly obvious is skin color. Scientists are discovering that there looks like about 10 to 15 genes in our genome that interact and control our skin pigment and skin tone. So two people of a similar complexion who have a child are probably going to have a child that resembles their skin complexion quite a bit. And not someone, and not a child whose skin uh, tone varies. Of course, uh, there are uh, some environmental factors, but skin color and skin tone have a strong biological component to them. And to be honest, you can't talk about uh, biology without talking about diversity, especially in, in the case of a species like ours that reproduces sexually, not asexually. When you reproduce sexually, uh, biology is built or diversity is built into that. So, 50% of uh, an uh, offspring's genome comes from the mother, and 50% of offspring's genome comes from the father. So a child is going to be very biologically different than either of their parents, and even if two children of the same parents come into existence, their genomes are going to be very different, because in each case, whichever 50% uh, was the mother's con contribution and whichever 50% of the father's genome he contributed uh, is really left up to chance. So uh, children in the same family are going to be similar genetically, but they're going to be different. And you're going to compare that to species who reproduce asexually, where they literally clone themselves to create offspring. Obviously, the offspring aren't going to be diverse uh, from their parents at all. So parent and child are going to have the same uh, genetics. So again, uh, diversity is, is built in practically to biology. But now we're going to talk about traits that actually have um, more of a behavioral component and not necessarily just a physical component. So not things like, uh, like height and skin color, but we're going to talk about things like uh, propensity towards being artistic or propensity towards uh, extroversion rather than introversion. So here's a chart that I got from a, a recent article uh, uh, just a general summary of some of the um, results that behavioral geneticists have found with behavioral traits that have a heritable component. So a lot of these traits you'll see like at the top, so propensity towards extroversion, uh, is about 50% of the variance in the population it looks like can be attributed to genetic components rather than environmental components. Or if you look towards the bottom, um, religiousness in adults is uh, going to be about uh, 30 to 45 percent of the difference in the population in that is going to be attributable to genetic components. And how does this play into culture? Well, uh, to show the point that I'm trying to make, I took three of the traits from this chart that we're going to look at. So agreeableness and aggression. What scientists are saying is if you look at a population and you look at the difference within the population of people's tendency to be agreeable or aggressive. And of course, there's a huge range in between there. But if you look at their tendency towards agreeableness or aggressiveness, 42% of the variation of that population's uh, in that trait is going to be attributable to genetic factors, not environmental factors or cultural factors. The same thing with conscientiousness or conservatism, and that's political conservatism, not personal conservatism. So if you look at a population and you rate how conservative each person is uh, or tends to be in that population, surprisingly 45 to 65 percent of the difference in that population can be attributed to genetic factors. So we might think of 
conservatism as being a very uh, socially constructed uh, thing where people kind of choose how conservative they're going to be over time based on education and cultural factors. But what geneticists are telling us is a surprising uh, degree of one's conservatism can actually be um, attributed to genetic factors. Why is that important for culture? Well, culture is socially constructed. So social norms, rules, and the, the social climate that we create uh, of common rules and norms where we, you know, that we uh, create to get along with each other obviously is going to be socially constructed and we reconstruct it based on experience and, and based on environmental factors and whatnot. But all culture is socially constructed by creatures who have biologies. So that means that if a trait like agreeableness has possibly a 42% explanation in genetics, that means that uh, a culture that is more inclined genetically towards agreeableness or aggression are going to create two very different cultures. The uh, culture um, of people who are inclined towards agreeableness may create a culture that rewards agreeable behaviors, uh, punishes aggressive behaviors pretty, pretty uh, sternly, um, and things like that, whereas a culture that uh, is, tends towards a more aggressive outlook are going to create a culture that maybe rewards aggressive behaviors more and uh, punishes agreeable behaviors more. So while culture is socially constructed, uh, all social construction starts with people who have biological natures. And those biological natures, to some degree, will indirectly influence uh, what culture is, is being socially constructed. The last thing I want to talk about is fairly complicated, but it's about how geneticists figure out whether a trait has a genetic component or not. Uh, because of course, if you tested people within a certain household to see if they have the same trait, the obvious answer is, well, it could be environmental as well because you're talking about people raised in the same environment. So what they do is, uh, it's a very clever experiment, is they uh, take sets of uh, monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins. Monozygotic twins are identical twins. They share 100% of their DNA. And dizygotic twins are uh, fraternal twins. They share 50% of their DNA. And they look at these sets of twins, both uh, who are raised in the same environment, and more importantly, these sets of twins when they're raised in different sets of environments. Because if you look at uh, a set of twins who are raised in different environments and they turn out to have the same um, behavioral features, then you can be pretty sure that, gen uh, that genetics has more of an explanation than environment because they're raised in two very different environments. Uh, whereas if you look at sets of twins who are raised in the same environment, um, you can look at uh, them having similar features, but it's not terribly surprising because they were raised in the same environment. So let's put it this way. Let's say that we take our two twins and we, um, they're raised in separate households. One is adopted, one is kept by the biological parents, or they're both put into foster care. One of them's put into one environment, one of them's put into another environment. If you raise them in different environments, but you find out that when you test them later in life and they have pretty similar traits uh, behaviorally, you can be pretty sure that there's a strong heritability of that trait. So let's take agreeableness and aggressiveness. If our two twins are raised in different environments, but if, when we test them in, the, in their 20s, they show about the same level, level of agreeableness or aggressiveness in, uh, in, in surveys and, and behavioral analyses, we can be pretty sure that that trait has a strong heritability component. Whereas if we, raise the tw uh, if we raise the twins in the same environment and we look to see what, their, what traits they have similar, uh, it's probably not going to be as much of a genetic component because we can always say that their environment probably contributed to them having those same traits. But even then, sets of twins who share 50% of their DNA in common are probably going to show more uh, relation to each other in terms of the traits they have than just brothers and sisters at random or even worse just members of the general population who don't share the same parents so um, when behavioral geneticists create these studies what they expect to find is that twins who share 100 percent of the, their dna will have a lot more behaviorally in common whether they're raised in the same or different environments than dizygotic twins or fraternal twins raised in the same environment and those twins will have more in common uh, behaviorally than just members of the general population who don't share genetics in common. And based on that, what they can say, they can estimate the percentage of the variation among these people 
that can be attributed to genetics. So they can really work out how much of these differences were attributed to environmental factors versus how much are probably attributed to genetic factors. But here's the last point that I want to make about that. You'll see a lot of studies that say that uh, scientists have found the tendency towards agreeableness is 50% heritable. And what most people want to take from that is, oh, that means that 52% of my tendency towards agreeableness must be genetic and the rest of my trait uh, is, is environmental. So 52% of my agreeableness is beyond my control, it's genetic, and, and you know, 48% is um, attributed to environmental causes. That's not quite what these studies are saying, and this is a very important point, because a lot of people who um, don't, are uncomfortable with the idea of behavioral genetics misunderstand what the studies are generally saying. They're not saying that 52% of any individual's trait is biologically determined. What they're saying is that 52% of the variation between people who are studied look like it's attributable to a variation in their genetics. Science can't generally say that 52% of an individual trait is due to genetics because science can't tell us how important genetics is to any individual's expression of their trait. But what it can say is that 52% of the variation in this trait amongst a population looks like it's explainable by genetics. It's a, a fairly subtle and complex difference, but it's a very important difference. So that's the first part where I talk about biology and genetics, and really the message here is that you can't talk about uh, variation in the population and diversity in the population without talking to some degree about genetics, because not only our physical features, but sometimes our behavioral features also look like they have some strong genetic component to them. In the next video, I'll talk about exactly why it's not even as simple as that and how genetics and culture and environment uh, interact in, in, in very complicated ways.